Hello, it's a pleasure to welcome you to another pre-concert talk for our next Masterworks performance. I'm Ed Parsons, General Manager of the Florida Orchestra. Always a pleasure to have with us our music director, Michael Francis. Thank you very much, Ed, and what a wonderful concert this is. A beautiful, moving, powerful, and uplifting way to start the new year. And our first two works are by Johann Sebastian Bach. And we start with his work, Riesercar A6 from a musical offering, as arranged by Anton Webern. Bach's Riechercar is an interesting work. It comes from 1747, just three years before his death. His son, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach, had been employed by Frederick the Great, King of Prussia, for many years. The king had long badgered Carl Philip to have his father visit the palace, which he finally did in 1747. When Bach visited the palace, Frederick the Great gave him a tour of, of the palace and had him play every keyboard that they found. And he asked him to do an improvisation on a theme that the king had worked on. He did, and the king was impressed. And when he went back um, home, this melody had stuck in Bach's head, and he worked it out, put pen to paper, and that became this piece. Nearly 200 years later, in 1934, Anton Webern took on the work as an exercise in orchestration in a style that he hoped would illuminate aspects of the music. He said, my orchestration attempts are to reveal the inner relation of the motives. This was not always easy. Of course, it also seeks to show how I see the character of the work. Isn't the point to awaken what is still sleeping in the secrecy of Bach's abstract rendering? And what came out was an instrumentation with single winds and brass, timpani, harp, and strings. The tonal qualities of this orchestration are unusual and surprising, often passing the melody between instruments one note at a time. Yes, Webern was part of the Second Viennese School, along with his teacher Arnold Schoenberg and Alban Berg. And these are the gentlemen who really took music as we recognize it with tonality, D major, C major, and things, and turned it into 12 tone music where every note is equal uh, and this became atonal this became a lot of the discordant music that people recognized from the early part of the 20th century and onwards but Webern looked at music in an unusual way if Gustav Mahler another Viennese composer would look at the great panorama of the Alps Webern would be in the same position would pick up a single pebble and observe the pebble from all the angles trying to understand it he was very much fascinated in the purity of the miniature most of his compositions are very short. He sort of, if, if you think of Lord Tennyson or, or Byron or Wordsworth, their long poems, well then I would say Webern is more about the haiku, these Japanese forms of very small, um, short poems. And in this piece, he takes a very unusual instrument, instrumental or, um, combinations in which you'll hear muted trumpets and then the melody will pass on them over to the violin and back. And this fragmented collage effect that comes from it. It's strangely hypnotic, slightly disturbing, but also extremely beautiful when you hear it in the whole. And so he allows all these instruments and these voices, a little bit like an Andy Warhol collage or even that, the, the Lincoln picture by Dali when you see the different squares, but only when you step back do you see the whole of this thing. Have this have a listen now to uh, Michael Lindvall just playing the opening theme, the musical offering, which is one of Bach's most famous renditions and uh, variations. is from Bach's famous concerto for two violins. It was written in 1730, and Bach had spent the previous seven years employed in Leipzig as music director of St. Thomas Church. His productivity during this period was astounding. He composed a new cantata for every Sunday service and religious festival, provided music for city events, uh, led four choirs, taught voice and instrumental lessons, and served as music director of the university. In 1729, he was appointed music director uh, of Leipzig's renowned Collegium Musicum, a mix of, of professional and university musicians who gave weekly concerts in the city. And this new position allowed Bach to stretch his secular wings. It was for one of these concerts that we think, probably, this piece was composed. 
Bach was also a big fan of Vivaldi and was probably an influence in this concerto, especially in the brisk outer movements and in the style of the solo writing. And for this, we'll welcome our two soloists from our orchestra, Nancy Chang, our associate concertmaster, and Sarah Shulman, our principal second violin, who will be our soloist for this week. Let's welcome them. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Sarah, for joining us for this pre-concert talk. We're about to play the Bach concerto for two violins in D minor. What is it about Bach that makes him such an important part of the musical canon? Nancy, perhaps you'd like to answer yes. this. Everybody knows that Bach is the father of the origin, uh, original music. We all, take, we, we all took theory classes in schools, and we all take what Bach has in his music that we created something new. So his music is pretty original. Um, uh, for example, um, um, I personally think that a lot of people think if people don't know Bach, will think that Bach is, has such a easy going music. You know, it looks so plain, nothing's going on. But technically, it's one of the hardest hardest technique that we all, as a violin, as any um, string players or e even even woman players, any musicians that have to really concentrate and practice because it's got the most basic um, technique in our um, training. Yes, it sort of shows up everything, doesn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. it does show, and it's so transparent. Absolutely, yes. transparent is a great word. Sarah, what's it like for you? I mean, this music to me has a very strong spiritual dimension to it. Obviously, his faith is important. But for anybody, no matter your faith, this music has an ex exceptional depth. Yes, it's definitely very timeless, and I think that really anyone can appreciate it, uh, despite tons of musical training or lack of musical training. Um, this particular piece is very meaningful to me, as is Bach, because I grew up as a Suzuki kid, learning the Suzuki method, and this is one of the first real pieces that we get to play as children and get to play together. So we get to practice our own basic technique, but also ensemble playing. And so to be a 10-year-old, you know, playing the Bach double concerto with other kids is just mind-blowing, and that actually doesn't change as you get older. It gets a lot harder because the bar gets set higher, but as Nancy was saying, you know, it's, there's so much depth to it. Uh, the technique seems so easy, but it's actually not because there is such a depth of spirituality and it has to be so perfect in its transparency. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. They say that Bach is too easy for amateurs and too difficult for professionals, a little bit like Mozart. So let's have a listen to this rather Italian version of Bach. And then when we come to the second movement, this really is a, a song without words. We were talking about this yesterday. There's that film Master and Commander with Russell Crowe and Paul Bettany. And they, the deepest part of the film is the conversation they have when they play the violin and they play the cello. It's the things that you can't say with words. And to me, this movement sums it up perfectly, the intimacy of things unspoken. Perhaps we can hear a bit of the second movement. so much. Really timeless music. He seems to float and he feels like it goes on forever. But in the third movement we're right back into full Italian drama. Something very operatic about this music, isn't it? Yes. And I think Bach can be underestimated for that sense of fire. Let's hear a bit of the third movement. small glimpse of what we're about to hear. Thank you, Nancy Chang. Thank you, Sarah Shellman. It's going to be a wonderful performance. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thanks. Let's go. 
looking forward to it. We finish our program with the Fifth Symphony of Felix Mendelssohn, subtitled The Reformation Symphony. While it's called the Fifth Symphony, it was actually only the second one that he wrote. He composed it in 1830 when he was just 20 years old. He composed it in honor of the 300th anniversary of the Augsburg Confession, a key document in the formation of the Lutheran Church. He desired it for it to be included in the citywide celebration in Berlin on the anniversary, but he found little interest in it being included. Even if it was, fate would not have allowed it. He contracted measles from his sister, which set him back months in composing it. It was premiered in 1830 with Mendelssohn at the podium, but only had one performance. Mendelssohn was notoriously hard on himself and thought the work to be substandard and a bit of juvenilia and set it on the shelf. Thankfully, it was found and published after his death, hence the placement as the Fifth Symphony. It was his sister, Fanny Mendelssohn, who gave it the Reformation title. Yes, and I think that's a really interesting point, is that Mendelssohn really loved this piece, but because of the rejection that he had later on, and because of all the various permutations he put into it, the different versions, he really wanted it to succeed. This is in many ways his own ninth symphony, a desire to unite us all. And, it's, and as we talk through it, there's a lot of very, very personal and uh, informative aspects to understand his faith and faith in general. But because of the failures of it, I think he was embarrassed and he just said it's childish and didn't want to be with it later on. And a lot of composers do that, but it's not necessarily a good example of what they felt like when they wrote it. So the piece begins, um, and you'll hear this theme in the violas, which actually is a musical symbol of the cross. Da, da, di, di. You'll hear this, and he's written a lot of this ecclesiastical writing into it. It feels like the music just emerges, almost like a Gregorian chant, something from an antiquated age. Soon after this, this is punctuated by these unusual little fanfares in the horn and trumpet, reminding us that man has the capacity to take something which is pure and noble, like the idea of God, like the idea of church, even denominational divisions, such as Catholic or Protestant, but divide it and use it for his own conquering pursuits. And here, then the horns come in, it's clearly something military, and it's rather disturbing in this beautiful um, ecumenical Gregorian feeling that we have, you can almost smell the incense until this thing cuts through like a razor. The music becomes increasingly animated until suddenly after the most powerful of these fanfares, the shock from getting to this point in the introduction from where we started with this little viola hymn is quite galling. But then the air clears and we hear this Dresden Amen, something that Wagner would later use in Parsifal, one of the most beautiful and well-known Amens, and something that was used by the Catholic and the Protestant Church. And that becomes very, very important as we try to understand what is going on in this piece.
such a sublime passage of music, particularly in light of where we were. So when we now start the fast section in the first movement, it's absolutely clear that we are at war. There is some battle between maybe Catholics and Protestants. You feel this tension, you feel this violence erupting, and the writing for the orchestra is virtuosic, it is dark, it's in D minor, the same key as the beginning of the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven. And this is music that punctuates, that punches, that just grabs you by the scruff of the neck and just hollers into your face something dark and powerful and meaty. <laughs> And so the first movement continues in this battle. There are moments where you almost feel like Friar Lawrence in Romeo and Juliet tries to settle the nerves. But fundamentally, the fast section, the allegro, is violent, it is thrusting, it is, it is just something so um, powerful going on. Until the very, very end, the music just seems to implode on itself. We collapse in these in mighty, huge chords as if the music is ground to a halt. There's nothing more we can do. There's nowhere else to conquer, no one else we can kill. And then when the Dresden Amen comes back at this point, we are left in a completely different world. And when the Allegro comes back afterwards, it is more tentative, as if we have a sense of reflection and concern for the way that we have used this religious ideal for our own conquering geographical, indeed territorial, advantage. And so the first movement will finish with a great powerful drive as we rip off this thing. There's no sense of any peace at this moment. And for a lot of people, this second movement feels rather unusual. It's suddenly rather lighthearted, very much Mendelssohn that we recognize from Midsummer Night's Dream. We have to remember Mendelssohn was 21 when he wrote this. Mendelssohn was a genius on the level of Mozart. He had much more wealth when he was growing up. He came from a wealthy family, a Jewish family, and that becomes very important when we come to the third movement. When he was a child, he was great friends with the German writer Goethe. And this connection, Goethe encouraged him to travel. So by the time he was 21, he'd lived a life that most of us haven't done by the time we're 40 or 50. Indeed, by the time Mendelssohn died, when he was in his late 30s, they said he had the countenance of an 80-year-old man. He worked so hard during his years, achieving so much in such a short space of time, very much like Mozart. So this movement, to understand it, we have to go back to his childhood. Um, which actually isn't that far before. He was 21, as I mentioned. And there's a, there's a phrase that he describes in a letter describing choir boys with golden tassels and this idea of something more beautiful and bell ringing and the joyous aspect of the religious service. There's a beautiful trio as, in, in the, as the music goes to a more reflective moment and that music comes back in the second movement and then we arrive at the very heart of this. A movement that I think is often underestimated, the slow movement, because it is here that Mendelssohn shows something really powerful. Mendelssohn, as I mentioned, was, was Jewish. His grandfather Moses Mendelssohn was a well-known philosopher and writer. His father Abraham Moses 
had insisted that they transfer from being Jew Jewish in their faith Judaism to Lutheran um, to become, well, to basically to make their careers easier, their lives easier. Anti-Semitism was rife in 1830s Germany. And so they were concerned that because they were Jewish, that they would be oppressed. So he was told to, <clears throat> to uh, trans, what do you call it, not transfer, but uh, to change faith. I can't think of the word right now, uh, when he was seven years old. And I think that was a very powerful moment for him, both good and bad, that sense of his Jewish past being lost. So when we begin this third movement and the violin starts, they're actually singing a Jewish um, ecclesiastical greeting, which is Hevenu Shalom Aleichem, which is peace unto you. It's something that was well known. You can hear that now in the music. So much of that third movement is deeply, deeply touching as you feel these powerful emotions come out, this sense of yearning, longing, perhaps even loss of that, sense of that Jewish aspect of his life, his faith, as if he had to shut the door on one part of himself so that he had to move forward as he was told to by his father and also to be accepted into society. Very moving stuff. As we come out of the third movement, we go into this incredible flute cadenza. And the flute was the instrument of Martin Luther. So when we begin this section, you'll hear Daphne, our principal flute for this week, um, play this. You'll notice that it feels very reflective, like a recitative, until then we head, the second theme, into his most famous chorale, Eine Festeburg, um, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, which is one of the most famous of all Lutheran chorales, as we now start to be united in one faith. The first movement we've been fighting, the second movement we've been reflecting, the third movement we've been mourning, the, the loss of faith, and in this now we move into something which brings us together, and humanity is being united in a positive way. So here's Daphne to play the recitative. continues this now into the fast section of the last movement, where the music builds up and it really feels very different to the first movement. If we had all this bustle and violence and, and this wild interdenominational battle going on, at this point now it feels more like music of the common folk. We hear wind bands, we hear music that is almost, dare I use the word, trite. It has a, a lightness, it has a, a, a flippancy, you hear banners waving and flags all going in the wind band of the, 
of the, of the villages and of the townspeople singing out. Here's just a little example of that you can hear in the music. up towards the great, powerful, mighty climax at the end of this incredible symphony, where we started in this ethereal darkness, this gentle hymn in the violas has gone through all sorts of developments, through battles, through reminiscence of childhood, into the most poignant self-expression of faith, and finally now, through Martin Luther's vision of united humanity and future, Mendelssohn has come to this moment his own personal Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, a call for unity, something so important to all of us. And as we finish now in blazing glory, the orchestra builds up in speed up until the final rendition of Ein Festival, a mighty fortress is our God. Mendelssohn said so much with such maturity, it's just stunning to think he did this at 21 years of age. Thank you all very much. Look forward to seeing you on the weekend for this uh, glorious start to the new year. Happy New Year.